you were here last night. Because I've seen people in the hallway, obviously, I don't know you, but they're like this. <laughs> I'm like, wow, my lasting impression was like, you totally cracked me up. Versus fired me up. We woke, no. Okay, last night, and by the way, um, Jordan comes to visit Viewpoint Church uh, often enough that I've picked up one of his habits, and I almost did it tonight. He, he usually gets up and he says, and we're a morning church. So this evening, and we're all like, it's like 10. <laughs> and I almost, I've been standing here going, what's the first thing I'm going to say? Like, good morning. I'm like, no, I'm not. It's like four. Okay. So um, let's pray. Father, we pray for the median outpouring of your Holy Spirit on this room, each person, you have a word for us, I believe, to change our culture and make history. Give us the belief, the hearing ears, the seeing eyes, the conviction that we're in this now with you, and you're going to give us our marching orders. We ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pick up kind of where I left off last night, but I gave up an outline on prayer because prayer has kind of been the theme of my life and I took the span of my life in prayer and kind of divided it into four segments. First, prayer was the door to humility. It was this place where I came to Christ at 21 years old. I, I really was an alcoholic and a drug addict and they uh, hit a car and was in a suicidal place and I had one of those come to Jesus dramatic conversions where someone led me to Christ, I didn't know. He was a stranger, but I had driven to this church, you know, thinking, I got to find God. And it was a small little mainline church in Monterey, California. And he just said a simple prayer with me. And at 21 years old, you know, maybe it wasn't a, a crusade. It wasn't a Bible study. It was some guy praying with some young, really broken person. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. And forgive me for my sins. And I remembered thinking, you know, he said, you're a sinner. And I, I didn't think, no, I'm not. I mean, it was so obvious <laughs> that this humility piece is, I think, where everybody's got to start with Jesus. I will bow my face to the ground and realize you are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You died for me. You know, and I had, you know, it's interesting. I was in a, a, a junior church of the kind of church I was raised in. That was the comfort I felt like. I got to find God. And even though I went to church and uh, for every single Sunday till I was 17 and left home because my parents made me, and I would sit and stand, I went through confirmation, and I went through catechism, and I went through all this stuff, I, I'm still looking for God. And I, I got him. I found him. He knew, it's like he knew where to send me. And I went to the place that I was most comfortable, but dear Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins. And I prayed the prayer of humility that I talked about even last night, that you've got to pray every day of your entire Christian life. You know, search me, know me, test me. Uh, I have 41 years of sobriety. So that's a big piece of my testimony. My father's an alcoholic. His father's an alcoholic. His sister was an alcoholic. When I came to Christ, I, I, I got it. That's the old life, and it's dead. This is the new life. I often think the best thing about my testimony, and it's been all over the world, Focus on the Family, Billy Graham Crusades, books, all over best thing is that I believed Ralph the janitor when he said to me, 2 Corinthians says when someone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person inside and old things pass away and all things become new. And I literally looked at him and went, okay. <laughs> I didn't have baggage that said, you shouldn't do that and you can't do that and you can't be this and don't do that. I'm like, I'm in, all in, let's go. And I started to lead people to Christ so fast that people were like, whoa, I became the kind of Christian, I said last night, that Christians don't even like to be around. 
They're always talking about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Prayers, the first prayer is the prayer of humility. The second was my prayer was a pathway to intimacy. I'd been a, a, a youth worker. I mean, what, what do 21-year-olds who come to Christ because of all their craziness and just have this dramatic conversion, quit smoking and drinking and swearing and sleeping around all in one day? I mean, what do they do? They go right back to their high school or to college kids and just start talking about Jesus. And everybody's like, whoa, you are like so different. Yeah, that is what a Christian is, isn't it? Really? I mean, back in the day, and you can see I was back in the day. (laughs) That's what it meant to be a Christian. You are totally different. You are on fire. You make people uncomfortable because they can feel the heat. Yes, I'm serious. Oh, I remember, I remember, I, I, I met some lump along lazy Christians right after I became a Christian. And they're like, chill, cool down. You're, I'm like, no, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> they, would, they would say things like, they, they, they would complain to my boss. She gets excited about the littlest things. I said to Roger the other day, I still do. I love that. I get excited about the littlest things where I see Jesus. In fact, I, I just saw a friend, and she said to me, you are just still always open and looking. Where is he? Who's going to bring him to me today? How's it going to come? What, what are they going to say? I wake up. I wake up going, okay, today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day. Because I, I, since the day I came to Christ, 1976, August 26, I felt like God said, you are going to change the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. I did. And every day I wake up, I'm like, I haven't done it yet. And I'm getting old. Er. Prayer became the pathway to intimacy. I was in Youth for Christ. Awesome organization. Especially, you know, there were, there were a lot of young baby Christians who all served in Youth for Christ together. So they were like... 40 of us single people, and we were just killing it. Cleveland was a, a mainline, mainline church kind of town there. So, so we would, had a lot of play in the public high schools, and, and, and we had a lot of grace, and, and principals loved us being in there. And I was a cheerleading coach. I mean, a cheerleading coach knows everybody. You've got all the cheerleaders. You've got, you know, all the football players. You're in charge of all the pep rallies. I, I, I knew all the principals. I knew all the teachers. I had so much play. And, and I remembered I, I had a varsity cheerleading squad that came to breakfast study every Wednesday. And, and I, would, I, I, I literally... Did what the book said. You teach them about this, teach them about that, teach them about that. So the day I taught on prayer, I'm like, and you're supposed to spend time with God every day and la-da-da and read your Bible every day. And, you know, it's a great theory. (laughs) But when you're a youth worker, after about seven years, right, AJ? Give me a name. You were like two years, I'm done with this. (laughs) You say, I'm tired. I'm tired too tired to do this. I'm too old to do this. I'm too, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. But I had all these kids and I let, I, I remember where I was. I was like in a Bob's Big Boy, a diner, a breakfast diner, 6 a.m. I did this every Wednesday. I would, I had one of those old Lincolns where you had like a, a like you could fit seven people in a two car. <laughs> Somebody's gift to youth for Christ. I had it. <laughs> With a gangster lean, you know? <laughs> Serious. I would take all those cheerleaders, and I walked out of that one Bible study, and I heard the Lord say, you don't even do this. Wow. That kind of prepared me for the National Youth for Christ Convention that was upcoming in the next few weeks. And all the Cleveland staff boarded a van with our board and staff, and we headed from... Cleveland to Chicago, and it was every former president of Youth for Christ spoke. Kelly Beal, Ted Angstrom, Robert A. Cook. These are names, Jake, I mean, these were names. Billy Graham was the first Youth for Christ uh, staff person. So it was the 40th anniversary of Youth for Christ. And I, I remember sitting in the room going, okay, I want to be the president of Youth for Christ, so I'm going to do anything they say. I'm going to listen to everything they say. And every single person, and I asked them all afterward talked about prayer. And they weren't asked to speak about prayer. They were asked to speak about their most important part of presidency in Youth for Christ. And each told a story 
an adventure, a miracle. And I remembered sitting there thinking, I'm missing it. And people like me don't want to miss it. And I thought, I'm too lazy, I'm too busy, and I'm too tired to pray, and I'm missing it. So I went to the optional workshop on prayer, and I'm 29 years old. I'm the mother of a toddler. I'm, I'm this youth worker. I'm this cheerleading coach. I, I am packed with kids 24-7. They all have my phone number. Don't do that if you're a youth worker. <laughs> and I stood at the door and went, don't go in, go in, don't go in, don't. Because I, I kind of I felt like, oh, this is going to change my life. And I had a girlfriend standing outside, and she's like, you're not going in there, are you? Like, not you. You can't keep your mouth quiet at all, ever. Why would you do this? Because right next door was like how to have the biggest camp. And next door to that was how to have the best crowd breakers. I think my husband went to that one. He can pull out crowd breakers. He's good at that. He was my boss, by the way. <laughs> have you ever lived with your boss? Oh. <laughs> Who happens to be a marriage counselor? You're like in major fishbowl your whole life. <laughs> it's good. It's good. You should do it. <laughs> and I made a decision in this workshop. You know, God took a weekend to take a 29-year-old, now I'm about six years sober, fired up haphazard praying, too tired, too lazy, kind of a big mouth, easily jealous, still very easily angered, almost dry drunk. <laughs> and I make a decision to pray for one hour a day for the rest of my life. On, that was 35 years ago. That's like 12,000 some days ago, 12,000 hours ago to spend one hour a day with God for the rest of my life. And I remember the woman in the workshop did not call for that. She just said, she, she asked us to pray, and I remember sitting there, and I start to cry. And, and a vice president of Youth for Christ, and at the time you're 29, and the vice president of Youth for Christ, wife taps you on the shoulder, and she said, are you okay? Do you want to pray? I'm like, I think I'm supposed to ask God, I, I think I'm supposed to tell God I'm going to pray for one hour a day for the rest of my life. And everybody looked at me like, oh, don't do that. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> And it was too late. It was out my mouth. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm that kind of person. I go running to the lunch where everybody's waiting for me, all the staff who's known me. I'm late for every meeting all the time. I come running in there, and I'm like, you won't believe this. I have asked. I have said a prayer, and I'm going to, I made a commitment to pray for one hour a day for the rest of my life. And they're like, no, that's not going to happen. You can't do that. <laughs> well, believe me, the minute they said that, I thought, you watch. <laughs> So the first day I wake up, I literally like have to set the alarm. And I realize, oh, no, I love to sleep. What was I thinking? <laughs> and I'm like, OK, 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 I got to set the alarm. I got to make this good. I got to set the alarm. OK, so I start setting the alarm, and I realize I'm waking my husband up. And I'm like, OK, we can't do that. OK, I got it. Lord, wake me up before my alarm. And I'd set it, you know, like for 7. And like 5.30, I get up, and I, I, my eyes wide open, and I go, oh, not this early, Lord. <laughs> I go paddling, tootling into the kitchen, Cleveland, Ohio, snowy. It's February 1984. I remember everything about it. And I don't know how it happened, but there was a book in our bookshelf. Oh, I know how it happened. My husband gets books. Oh, my gosh. My husband's the book buyer. He keeps Amazon in business. One comes every day, and this is for 41 years of marriage. But there was an old Andrew Murray book, Christ in the School of Prayer. So this is like day one. And I open the book, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm in. I'm in this. It was like, I'm in. And I start. And I, I said, Lord, I need an idea because I pray for myself pretty much. That's it. And I don't confess sin, and I forget to pray for everybody. And God gave me an idea. It was, it was, it was so simple. Develop a notebook, gave me a name of it, call it my partner. It'll have two parts. I mean, I can't tell you. 
since I've been in Boise, I, I did this workshop in Boise. The people, they know I'm here on my Facebook page. Uh, I did this maybe 15 years ago in Boise, Boise. I just taught them how to pray. Because intimacy with the triune God is Papa, Jesus, Holy Spirit. And I'm just too ADD for this stuff. So God gave me an idea. And I developed a notebook. I called it my partner. This little cheerleading coach from Cleveland, Ohio, uh, there's over a quarter of a million, my partner prayer notebooks somewhere in America, and a quarter of a million books called Let Prayer Change Your Life. This little cheerleader who asked God for, well, I was a cheerleader too, but I was a cheerleading coach at the time, asked God for an idea. By the way, my cheerleaders helped me make the first hundred of these. And every time I'd talk about it, somebody wanted a notebook, and we'd all run to the store, and we'd make another hundred. We're like, okay, this is too much. Pretty soon a publisher picked it up, and I began to teach people to pray in two parts. My part spells P-A-R-T. I was a cheerleading coach, you can tell. <laughs> P for pr I still can cheer. Okay. P for praise. I'd never read the book of Psalms. I, 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 I can't play an instrument. I, I can read music a little bit, but... Right, right then, I heard Billy Graham read the Psalms every single day. And I'd been a Christian about seven years. I was 29 years old. I'm like, I'm not. I'm okay. And so I've read one to five Psalms every day in, for 35 years. Every day. And they're my personal praise prayers. And they've taught me to pray. Eugene Peterson, in the uh, introduction to the Psalms, in the message translation said, for most Christian centuries, Christians learned to pray by praying the Psalms. So I read that 10 years after I'd done this. So God was saying, I, I, I got to teach you to pray. You're going to need a new language. And it is, you are unfailing. You are everlasting. You are all powerful. Oh, oh, th okay, this is not 29-year-old attic language. I, I needed a new language. And I began to praise him. And then I would confess my sins in writing every day. I would, I would literally confess my sins in writing every single day. And, you know, a psalm was very appropriate. And I prayed it every day for 35 years. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Psalm 139, verses 23, 24. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way that's everlasting. And, you know, not a day's gone by where I'm like, no, nope, nothing today. <laughs> In fact, and you might find this interesting, I literally thought, oh, he wants me to pray an hour a day because I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. So the very first week I pray, I get to this admit section because that was my kind of deal. He gave me the idea, praise, admit, request, and thanks. It spells part. So when I got to admit, I'm like, search me, oh God, and I hear this, you're a very angry mother. I had a four, five-year-old toddler. You scream and you yell and holler at him, just like your mother did to you, and you hated her. You left home at 17. You swore in her face, and you never came back till you became a Christian. You're doing this to your little boy. I got to tell you, praying one hour a day and admitting your sins, and this would save you a lot of money in a counselor. I said to my husband, oh, my gosh, okay, so when you leave home, you don't really know. I kind of go ballistic. I don't touch them, but I really let her rip. And he said to me, counselor that he is, you know, a mother that yells at her boy will raise a child to uh, disrespect women. I'm like, oh, no. The one thing I want is a boy who loves Jesus. I'm like, okay. So I said, okay, okay, I'm not going to yell at Jake up to a certain level. No more. So I said to Jake, and he's like five. I'm like, Jake, I had a conversation with God. I'm only allowed to yell up you up to here, and I can't go past it, and I'm, I want you to be accountable, and you've got to tell Daddy if I do it, and, and i got to tell Daddy if I do it. So this is good. This is good. So one day I go, Jacob, Anthony, Tirabasi goes, Mom, you told God you weren't going to do that. <laughs> I'm like, get your room. Just get your room. He's like, 
Mom, I'm like, what? He said, God told me I can come out. <laughs> I would tell you I grew up in an angry, screaming, yelling, hollering home, and I'm going to tell you one thing. I've prayed for 35 years every single day for one hour and always gone to my midsection, and I would have thought it's so that I can be a world changer. But I am the mother of one boy. I only have one child. He served five years as a missionary in Uganda. He loves Jesus, different than me. Loves Jesus. Married a missionary. Loves his mom. I know he loves his mom because he was an alternate school teacher where kids were like jumping out the window and they were in the bad class and whatever. And I called him, just invite him for dinner, thinking he'd go to voicemail. And he picks it up and he's like, Mom, why are you calling me in the middle of the day? I'm like, Jake, why are you answering? <laughs> I said, I just wanted to invite you to dinner. He's like, well, I, I got, literally, this is true. I got kids jumping out the window right now. I got to handle this. I said, okay, see you later. He goes, okay, love you, Mom. Yeah. So I think this admit section, as much as I, I think it's for the clean heart to be a, a good preacher and all those things, it's to be a mom and a wife who leaves a legacy for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, my son's never heard me swear. My, my son has never seen me drink. There's never been alcohol in my home. I told my son, we were, I, I am going to be by far the most fun Christian you've ever met. <laughs> and it's true. It's, it's true. AJ, you could almost say that because AJ was at Point Loma, and my son went to Point Loma many years separated. But Point Loma asked me to speak when AJ had still, you know, just left. It was fresh. And I said, AJ, go with me. So AJ and Becky, what, are we 40 years apart, maybe? We take my car down there. We do the talk. We come home, and AJ's like, you got to hear this song. It's Holy Ghost Dance Party. I'm like, OK. So we're driving home from San Diego to Santa Ana. He turns it on, and all of a sudden, if my car could have been doing this, <laughs> we've got the windows down. We're on. And we're like going and yelling and singing. But we did it all the way. We just hit repeat, repeat, repeat. All the way. Was it an hour and a half? Yes. I don't even know why I told that story. Because I am the most fun Christian. So now when I play a song 10 times because I totally love it, it doesn't matter what time of day, what city I'm in, I text AJ with the song. You got to hear this song. And we got to dance together next time. In fact, he's known as, who are you known as? I'm Justin Timberlake. <laughs> Who are you? Bruno, Bruno Mars. <laughs> I am the most fun Christian who doesn't drink. <laughs> you should have been here last night if you think I'm telling stories outside of school. OK. <laughs> Prayer is the door to humility, the pathway to intimacy. Uh, I really grew in my faith I, tremendously. And what it was is I began to pray about everything. I began to pray about everything. I remember looking up every scripture back. This is old, old school. You had to go into the concordance in the back of your Bible. You had to write down every verse. Then you had to go to the Bible to find it in every verse. And then you had to write down what the verse was. And I went to every one of them. Ask, believe, pray. And I remember I put the whole thing together and I went, oh, if I believed half of what that said, I would be the most radical Christian. So good. Yes. So it's the place where you will most grow. I remember I, I'd walk into work. I'd go, you won't believe this. You won't believe what this principle allowed. You won't believe what happened today. And people were sick of it. They're like, what God do today? Why don't you put me on the prayer list? I'm like, no, get your own prayer list. You know, I'm already up at 6 o'clock. You get it. You do it. Get going. Come on, people. I said last night that prayer was the heart of purity. And holiness. And I would tell you this, you know, um, after about 20 years of being a Christian, 10 or 15 years of praying an hour a day, my husband and I saw the attrition of Christian marriages. Uh, he was a marriage counselor, a Christian marriage counselor primarily. So he only really counseled people who called themselves Christian. And there were so many divorces. And, and my husband, you'd, you'd ha you, I hope you meet him. He's just a good old boy. But he would come home some days and he'd say, I fight for their marriage harder than they do. Mm -hmm. That holiness piece is 
If you read every book, like I've read every book that is classic, Mueller, Spurgeon, Murray, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, um, Wesley Duell, you are not going to get more than a page down through a chapter and not hear about holiness. You are not. You will not. The old school, old church knew, oh, I cannot shame God's name. That's my highest priority. I cannot shame God's name. My, my, my reputation, my church, my, my re re marriage, my uh, reputation at work. And, and so prayer becomes, you know, after the intimacy comes, he, he loves you so much, he begins to tell you what other people have been trying to tell you. But how he can say it to you in a way that you walk out and you go, okay, I'm doing this. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing this for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the final thing I talked about last night where I'm going to pick up is that uh, prayer is where you get your strategy. It is where you get your strategy for everything, 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 how to be a parent, how to be a, 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 the worker you are in whatever field you're in, whatever vocation you're in. It's where you get your strategy. What are strategies, ideas? Um, Peter Marshall, former chaplain of the Senate, called them marching orders. You see, he, he was in, he, he was in um, like, merchant marines, and you would get your orders. You, get, you would get your orders from your captain. If you go out the day and you don't get your orders, what are you doing? Whose orders you got? Your own? Death? Could be trouble. So he, he, he pressed in, start every morning, get, get your marching orders from the captain. It, it pays to read old classic books. It does. There's a world there. There's a world there of people who bent their knee and bowed their heart to God every day. And, and it didn't matter what anyone else was doing. You couldn't move them off the dime. They would look at you like, are you kidding me? Would I follow the world? Are you kidding me? Should I look like the world? Well, actually, all you have to do is read the Bible to hear that. But they kind of repeated it. So last night when I talked about strategy, I felt like today it was strategy for your dream. I felt like today and what, what, what time we have left is that I should tell you about, uh, encourage you to pray for the strategy God has on your life, which he has done for many men and women. Not every man and woman, or not every man and woman will go for it. But God gives strategy, God gives men and women strategy to do something culture changing and history making. God gives it. God gives you a strategy to do something culture-changing and history-making for the sake of the gospel and the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to repeat that, that in prayer, God will give men and women, boys and girls, a strategy to be culture-changing, history-making people for the sake of the gospel and the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where I believe in prayer your life with God goes to a new level. One couple I uh, have looked up to, Bill and Vonette Bright, how many have heard of their name? Okay, founded Campus Crusade for Christ, what is now called Crew on Campuses. But Rather than tell you exactly the whole story about him, I would tell you that I became friends with Bill and Vonette Bright through the National Day of Prayer. And Vonette, in the year 2000, sent me a book, the autobiography of Bill Bright. He was still alive at the time, called Amazing Faith. And it was Fourth of July weekend, and I had done something bad. I'd, I'd yelled at, this is Raj again. I'd yelled at a guy, we were remodeling a house, and I yelled at a contractor, yelled at the top of my lungs, and my husband heard it and saw it. And he walks up, and my husband said, you're, you're going to have to apologize. And I went, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. And I walked away. And it was one of those, when you do things like that, you're going to pay. And not by that person, but God's going to deeply convict you. And I was weeping by the 4th of July. So when I get this book, I'm like, I am a total loser. I 
got to get this anger thing under control. I cannot ever. It's like alcohol with me. I know I can never. I never go there. I don't care. I don't want it. I'm, I've got to do that with anger. i got to hate it. i got to call it sin. I cannot do it. It ruins my witness. What am I doing? So I, I open this. I got it on the 4th of July. I open the book, and it's the story of Bill Bright. And I get to this eh, third chapter, and in it, is the story of the Fellowship of the Burning Heart from 1947. Henrietta Mears, you've probably never heard of her, was the young adult pastor at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Bill Bright, Louis Evans, the son of a very famous pastor from Bel Air Presbyterian Church, and Richard Halverson, later to become the chaplain of the Senate, were three guys, just guys, youth pastors and businessmen in the room, and she preached to be expendable for the Lord Jesus Christ. This whole story is in there. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And as I'm reading it, I'm, I'm feeling a call. Like, this is, this, if you were there, you would have been there. And what they did is they went to a room that night, or cabin, and they said, we're compelled to change the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we do? And they prayed all night, and they confessed their sin. And at the end, they wrote a contract. And they called themselves in the contract of Fellowship of the Burning Heart. Um, it went like this. I'm committed to the Christian, dis the principle, the Christian discipleship is sustained solely by God alone through his spirit. Therefore, I pledge myself to a disciplined devotional life in which I promise through prayer and Bible study and devotion to give not less than one continuous hour per day to God. And I went... Oh, my gosh. Now, I, by this time, about 15 years, I'm like, I'm in the fellowship. They're dead, but I'm alive. I could carry this on. They said, I'm committed to the Christian principle that begins with Christian character. Therefore, I pledge myself to a holy life of self-denial and self-discipline that I may live in chastity and virtue, sexual purity. I'm in. I'm committed to the discipleship exercise, therefore, of winning the loss to Christ. Therefore, I pledge myself to seek every possible opportunity to witness and to witness at every possible opportunity that I might be responsible for bringing at least one person to Christ every year. Do you know who knelt and prayed this? Bill Bright. Do you know when he died, 50 million people came to Christ, and, and Crusade was 50 years old, so every year a million people came to Christ, and he asked God, I'll bring you one. Okay, now there's a reason I'm telling you this, and it's because I believe, and I, I'm sensing, we've lost not the art of evangelism, we've lost the passion for evangelism, wow. right? Wow. We're, we're happy to build our houses and look good and get nice families and be good Christian families, but are, are we bringing the lost to Christ? Mm -hmm. Do we cry over them? Do we, do we, do we care deeply? I work for Youth for Christ. All we did was care deeply about the loss. That was our job. And the minute you get away, almost the minute I went to work for a church, I noticed that I could tell my testimony once, and then they were kind of over it. And I didn't last in the church very long because I'm an evangelist. I'm like, i got to go find the lost. i got to go find the lost. That's in me. But it was in them. And they would expend themselves in all sobriety. For the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm like, well, I'm there too. And I'm like, I'm in the fellowship. So I called on it. I'm like, okay. Who's doing the burning hearts? And she said, nobody. I mean, we, we did crew about three years after we wrote that contract. God gave us the strategy, the vision. And it's an incredible vision how they got it and what God said to them and how they were going to change every campus for the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? That was just a dream back in 1947. In about 1950, do you know what they did? Never in their whole married lives did Vonette and Bill ever own a house. They always lived under the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ. If they bought them a car, if they drove them somewhere, if they bought them a house, that's what they did. And what they do? They, 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 they're an international, worldwide organization that has one focus, lead people to the Lord Jesus Christ. They do. They are. And I looked at that book, I thought, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to carry this torch. I'm going to do it. 
And so one of the first things I did, and it was, it was just a little dream. It was like, how am I going to do it? I, I incorporated Burning Hearts, a nonprofit student organization. And then I kind of looked and I waited around like, what am I going to do? And oddly, I got a call to speak at Azusa Pacific. Now, I'd spoken there before. I'd done a lot of speaking, but I got this call. I hadn't done youth speaking, college speaking for a couple, maybe five years. I'd been on Women of Faith tour. I mean, I was all out there with the women. And I got this call, and I almost looked down on it. I'm like, oh, I'm too old. Huh. If I only knew then. No. And I said, OK, I'll come, I'll come. And I had a girl who worked for me, and she said, when you got up there, you started to tremble. And she goes, you're not a trembler. I'm, I'm more athletic. I'm like this. I'm trembling. And I tell the story of the burning heart, and I make a call to one day, one hour a day in prayer, to complete sexual purity and sobriety, and I called it purity, called a prayer, called a purity, and I called a purpose to lead one person to Christ each year. And oh, apparently there was a campus, uh, a screen off campus, and we were there for hours. If you ever are in a, a, a time like that with me, you don't want to be in the band. You could be there four hours, and you're like, oh. oh, oh. <laughs> I had, a, I had a fiddler. I'm like, keep going. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> It was one of those amazing moments. Um, I, I, I'm like, I, I've done college campuses, but this was like, he came down. Wow. The Holy Spirit came down. I mean, I remember my first kid was just sobbing, and he said, I'm on cocaine. And I'm like, what? You know, I, I look at a Christian... <laughs> campus and I'm thinking you're just the cream of the croppers I was it just was hours of sobbing kids and and and, and a, a girl came up to me a girl on staff she goes okay this never happens because the chaplain had said to me if you're not done at 10 they're out of here they're just going to get up and leave and I wasn't done at 10 and they didn't leave and hours went by and an old professor came up to me he said could you come back could you you, you, you talked about prayer, but you didn't teach us how to pray. We needed the how. You know, my, my, my prayer notebook, praise, admit, request, and thanks. Write a thank you note to God every day. Keep a prayer request list. Let God speak to you. And I showed, you know, when I came back, I said, I'll come back. I'll come back once. I'll come back once. You know, uh, I used the Bible for God's part to me. LMNOP, listening, messages, New Testament, Old Testament, Proverbs. I've read the Bible over 30 times. I just started seminary a few years ago. That's not why I read the Bible. I read the Bible to hear God's voice, to get my strategy, to be a difference maker, culture changer, history maker. Yes? And, and he's like, you got to come back. I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm so old. I, OK, I'll come back once. I came back. He goes, could you come back again? And the group did get smaller. And finally, I felt in my head, I, I just got to go every Sunday. And I was a golfer. I, I had a 19 handicap. That's really good for me. I went every single Sunday. I gave up Sunday golfing, and I would drive up to Azusa, and I'd meet with a small group of kids because you know why? One of these boys, Darren, I'll never forget him, and Teresa, who I hired as my first intern, said to me, this summer, three of us got together before you came, and we prayed for revival. So we ordered a book. And it's out of print now, and it's called Charles Finney's Lectures on Revival. I'm like, you are like 18 years old, and you're reading Charles Finney's like, give me that book. <laughs> I've never read the book, never heard of the book. And I literally, like, yes, I stole it from him. <laughs> I said, can I just read it? And I went back every week and started a fan of flame and a furnace on the message of the burning heart. Because I wrote a book, The Burning Heart Contract, and at the end I quote Henrietta Mears, who says this. At the end of their little uh, four people kneeling, they invited their whole little church to sign this contract, get involved in one hour a day in prayer, sexual purity and sobriety, and to lead one person to Christ. At the end of that, they're like, we gotta tell them, we gotta tell every college campus. So they did. And in two months, 80 to 90 college campuses had heard about it and drove to California from all over the United States. And from 1947 to 1949, 
there was a revival on college campuses. And Henrietta Mears had written this note and said to all of them, revival has started. God has given us the message. This is the call. But what's the call? What's the call to revival? OK. So I felt in my last few minutes that I should read you a little of lectures on revival. What is revival? Revival is the renewal of the love of Christians, resulting in awakening and conversion of sinners to God. A revival of true Christianity arouses, quickens, and reclaims the backslidden church and awakens all classes ensuring attention to the claims of God. Revival presupposes that the church is in a mired and backslidden state. He was not well liked for this book, but he went back and forth and back and forth during that great awakening, and he was the awakening preacher. And he saw it, and he knew it, and he called it out. And so what he did was come back and write lectures on revival. It was the strategy God gave him. And he said in the very preface, you might not like it, you might not want to do it, but this is what happened. A revival always includes Christians being convicted of their sins. Do you think a revival is for the lost? Do you think our nation needs a revival of Christians? Yes. In these definitions, backslidden Christians repent. Revival is nothing new, and I've said this over and over and quoted it tons of times, than a new obedience to God. That's what it is. That's what he wrote after. He would go into a city. He said movie theaters would close down, offices would close, and bars would close and everybody would come to church. Have you seen it yet? No, I haven't seen it in my lifetime. Have not. I want to. I will. Back, they said the faith of Christians is renewed. While they are backslidden, they're blind to the state of sinners. Christians' hearts are as hardened as marble and the truths of the Bible seem like a dream. They admit the words are true of the scripture, but their faith does not see the burning realities of eternity. But once awakened, they no longer see people as trees walking. Rather, a strong light reveals reality in a way that reignites the love of God in their hearts. Now they labor zealously to bring others to him. Our little church has two pastors, Roger and Becky Tirabasi. Their main gifts our evangelism. I don't know any church in America where they would ever even think to hire two pastors who had the gift of evangelism. Our poor church, every week. Why? I was lost. I was going to kill myself. I went to a high school where there were tons of kids, 2,000 kids. I went to a, a Bowling Green State University. I never heard the gospel. I have to be almost dead for a janitor to share the Lord Jesus Christ with me? OK, maybe, maybe I was a little hard and cold. But I'm going to tell you, and I'll close with this story. I was on an air airplane on my way to speak for the governor of Iowa, for the Iowa prayer breakfast. And they had a prayer team that prayed and prayed and prayed for one full year for me. I'm not kidding. By the time I get on this plane, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm as full of the Holy Spirit as I can be. And I, I've done a lot of speaking engagements. I just felt it. And I sit down on the airplane next to a girl, and she's crying. And I heard her say something to her husband. She hangs up the phone. She picks it up again. We haven't taken off yet. She's just crying. She hangs up the phone. And I'm like, would you like me to pray for you? She's like, ah. <laughs> Starts crying. She goes, my husband's a Christian. I'm not a Christian. I, I, I. She picks up the phone. Some lady sitting next to me wants to pray for me. Oh, my gosh. She hangs up the phone again. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> We're two hours to Iowa from here. Shh. Walk by. And the lady with the cart. lady with the cart says, would you like something to drink? She goes, yeah. Is it too early for vodka? I said, yeah. It's too early for vodka. It's 9 o'clock. She goes, no, I wasn't asking you. I was asking her. I said, well, I'm telling you, it's too early. And she, she's like, What's left? My testimony. 
So I start. I pull out the daily Bible, the My Partner Prayer Notebook, the Burning Heart Contract, and I start. And she's crying. Kleenex is thrown. The lady comes by, and with her cardigan, I'm like, keep going. Just... I'm in charge of this church right here, and you're not in it. That lady came to Christ on the airplane. Sinner's prayer out loud. And you want to know something? I've been in touch with her. I stayed in touch with her. But when I got off the plane in Iowa, I hadn't even spoken for the Iowa prayer breakfast yet. I get off the plane. I'm like, whoa. And they're like, whoa. And this guy says to me on the prayer committee, he goes, you go home. That was cool. That's it. We don't need you. No, I didn't go home. But I'm telling you, you don't need to read a book by Charles Finney to have a love for the lost. You know them. That, that one, so I did it with AJ and Carrie and, and, and 11 college kids in the summer of 2013 when we were planning our church. Nine stayed. Three are in ministry, like real ministry, loving the lost, loving church, changing the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. It was all we did was spend 21 days together. And what did these college kids have to do? They had to quit drinking and, and messing around. And that was like, are you kidding me? Do you really want me to do that? Not AJ didn't drink. Not Carrie. They, she didn't do it. Uh, they were like my strong help. But I'm saying, they, they so much pushback. I'm like, are you kidding? Let's use 21 days. I'm going through withdrawals. You know, I can't go to a party. I'm like, big deal. Come on. The lost are really lost. And the Christians don't look like it. But you're all you need. You're the one who works in your works place. You're the one in your home. You're the parent of your kids' friends. I would see Jake's friends coming in. Coming in. I'd say, oh, Pete, I pray for you. He's like, oh. <laughs> Don't pray for me. Jake had all non-Christian friends. I think you raise an evangelist home, you don't know anybody else. <laughs> Please. 2 Corinthians. Five. 17 through 20 says, when you become a Christian, you become a brand new person inside. Old things pass away. All things become new. So I implore you, be reconciled to God and then reconcile others to him. Let's pray. We love you so much. I just pray, Father, that you'll give us courage. Maybe it's not even courage. Just help us, just call us to do what we're to do in our sphere of influence, which will potentially speak into the life of the next D.L. Moody or Billy Graham or Henrietta Mears. Give us the heart of a parent to a lost child for everyone you bring into our sphere of influence. I pray, Father, not one of us would leave this place the same person we entered, if we're lazy after you, tired, to, too tired to pray for the lost, to get on our knees, to speak truth to those who are fallen, backslidden, to be a game changer and a, and a history maker. Today, Lord, call us and, and don't let us turn our back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.